Sky News. Senator Panfilo Lacson bears last-minute pork insertions in ratified proposed 2020 national budget. The Metropolitan Water Works and Sewerage System has revoked the extension of concession agreements of both Manila Water Company and Manilad Water Services Incorporated. Communist Party of the Philippines Founder Jama Sison agrees to resume peace talks with the government. The Philippines repeats a historic feat for wrapping up its 30th Sea Games campaign as overall champion on home soil. And top notch artist and a drone light show entertain spectators at the Sea Games posing ceremony at the New Clark City Athletic Stadium in Capas, Tarlac. Good evening. Senator Panfilo Lacson bears the last-minute pork insertions in the proposed 2020 budget after it was approved by the Bicameral Conference Committee. Nel Maribuhok reports. Senator Panfilo Lacson divulges the last-minute pork barrel insertions in the proposed 2020 budget. According to the Senator, this is the reason why he did not attend the signing of the bicameral conference report last night. He says he received a USB drive from the House of Representatives that contained two files, namely sourced and list files. In their preliminary assessment, last-minute insertions were made by the lower house. The said source file is the list of 1,253 budget items worth 83.2 billion pesos used as the congressman's source of their projects worth more than 16 billion pesos inserted in the BICAM report. The senator says there are no preliminary explanations on the said two files, so it's uncertain if the insertions are bigger than 83 billion pesos. On the initial list of the senator, the provinces of Albay, Cavite, Orsogon, Batangas, Bulacan, Pangasinan, and Cebu have huge allocations in the proposed budget. These are aside from the 117 flood control projects worth more than 3 billion pesos. Senator Lacson is hopeful President Rodrigo Duterte would veto the said questionable line items in the budget. According to Senate President Vicente Sota III, if these are proven, Senate will inform the President regarding the questionable insertions. Uh, in order not to delay the budget, we will just uh, inform the executive department that that's the assessment of uh, the Senate. Nel Maribuhok, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. The Duterte administration is confident that more Filipinos will live above the poverty threshold before President Rodrigo Duterte's term ends in 2022. Rosalie Cos tells us why. Lucy Alvarez has only one son who already graduated from college. Her husband is a government employee whose monthly income is not enough to sustain all the needs of the family. What Tessie does is help her husband with their finances by selling various goods. Nowadays, their household earns sufficiently to make ends meet and save even a little amount of money unlike in the past when they had a lot of expenses and loans to settle. Mas kami na lang mag-asawa para sa amin na lang po ngayon itong extra income ko. Kasi yung sa sweldo niya, hindi naman talaga sa pag-iing. Government employee. The situation of Tessie's family is a reflection of what the newest report of Philippine Statistics Authority or PSA is about. According to the PSA, an estimate of nearly 6 million Filipinos were lifted out of poverty from year 2015 to 2018. The 2018 poverty incidence among population in the country was estimated at 16.6%. This is 6.7% lower than the record in 2015, which was 23.3%. Poverty incidence is the proportion of poor Filipinos whose per capita income is not sufficient to meet their basic food and non-food needs such as health care education and others. According to the government, a family with five members should have a monthly income of at least 10,727 pesos to sustain its basic food and non-food needs. 
Socioeconomic Planning Secretary Ernesto Pernia is confident the poverty incidence in the country will further reduce to 11% before President Rodrigo Duterte's term end in 2022. My estimate is I think it's going to go down to 11%. If you let poverty incidence, which is 16.6% now, drop by 2.23 percentage point a year, then you will you, we will hit, I think, something like 11 or yeah, even less than that. For the Duterte administration, there are several factors which contributed to the reduction of the poverty incidence, such as job generation, policy reforms like the passage of law, institutionalizing conditional cash transfer program, unconditional cash transfer, and intensified family planning program. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanya. More than a week after the onslaught of Typhoon Tisoy, electricity in Sorsogon province is yet to be restored. The government, meanwhile, continued to impose a price freeze on basic commodities. Details in this report. A price freeze is still in effect in Sorsogon following the declaration of a state of calamity in the Typhoon Hit province. No price increase is allowed for basic commodities including sardines, milk, coffee, detergent, candles, bread, instant noodles, and bottled water. Restoration of power lines continues. The National Grid Corporation will start to resupply electricity to the province tomorrow. An official of the local utility cooperative says power supply may be restored soon in Sorsogon City proper. Anytime na pumasok yung NGCP, yung priority natin yung sentro muna ng Buwan, Sorsogon City. Electricity was earlier restored in hospitals in Sorsogon City a week after Typhoon Tisoy devastated the province. Power supply was directly tapped from a local hydropower plant. Base po sa kautusan ng ating gobernador, Chesis Escolero, ah, kailangan po maibalik ng uh, quick, no? so quick response, lalo na yung electricity sa buong dalawigan ng Sorsogon. Siyempre, meron tayong mga equipments na ginagamit like a uh, like uh, x-ray machine na kailangan yon para malaman at malapatan ng uh, tamang gamot yung ating mga pasyente. The Department of Energy aims to restore electricity in Bicol region before December 25. Roderick Mendoza, UNTV News and Rescue. The Senate has passed a bill for third and final reading seeking to extend the validity of firearms licenses from two years to five years. With 20 votes in favor, zero against and zero abstention, the Senate passed Senate Bill No. 1155 which seeks to amend Republic Act No. 10591 or the Comprehensive Firearms and Ammunition Regulation Act. Under the measure, the registration of a firearm shall be renewed every five years from the birth date of the licensee. During his sponsorship speech, Senator Ronald Bato de la Rosa said that a lack of practical renewal policies hinders gun owners from renewing their firearms. In other news, authorities in Tawi-Tawi say there's quite a huge number of buyers of illegal drugs in the province. This is after a joint anti-illegal drugs operation conducted yesterday. The three men got arrested. Dante Amento tells us why. Three suspects involved in selling illegal drugs were arrested in an anti-illegal drugs operation conducted by the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency, Philippine National Police and Marine Landing Team 9 in Poblacion, Bungao, Tawi-Tawi Province yesterday. The suspects were identified as Haberson Jaafar, Elmer Jamadin, and Adsfar Asali. Authorities recovered three plastic bags of 5 kilograms of suspected shabu, amounting to 34 million pesos from the suspects. Matagal na po na kinikase ito. Ito mga drug personality. Kaya uh, kahapon nga, naging matagumpay ng sirawang uh, operations. This bulk of recovered suspected Shabu is the largest amount of confiscated illegal drugs in the province so far this year. Itong ganitong uh, karating uh, uh, drugs na nahuli na, na, na po natin, uh, matasabi po natin na 
medyo marami no? yung mga kumukuha dito at uh, buhay The suspects are now facing charges for violation of Republic Act 9165 or the Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Act of 2002. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue. The Philippine team breaks and sets records in the 30th Southeast Asian Games, which ends today. This is yet another honor and pride for the Philippines. Bernard Dadis tells us why. With 149 golds, 117 silvers, and 121 bronze, or a total of 387 medals, the Philippine team claims overall championship in the 30th Southeast Asian Games. This is more than three times the number the Philippine delegates back in the 29th Sea Games in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia with 24 golds, 33 silvers, and 64 bronze, or a total of 121 medals. The Philippine delegation also breaks the country's 2005 record when we hosted the 23rd Sea Games in which we gathered 113 golds, 84 silvers, and 94 bronze. Gilas Pilipinas reached its 18th gold medal in Sea Games after crushing Thailand in men's basketball 115-81. And for the first time, the Philippine women's basketball team reaches gold medal in the Sea Games after defeating Thailand in the finals 91-71. The Philippine men's volleyball team replicates its record 42 years ago after winning silver medal. Aside from dominating in basketball, men's and women's, both in the 3x3 and 5x5 categories, the Philippine team also enjoys 14 gold medals in RVs, 11 in athletics, and 10 in dance sports. Other players also shine as they list the game's records. Christina Knott set a 23.01 seconds record in women's 200-meter dash. Natalie Uy passed the 4.5 meters bar. EJ Obiena set a new Sea Games pole vault record with a winning jump at 5.45 meters. 15-year-old ovarian cancer survivor Daniela De Pisa brings pride and inspiration as she won gold in rhythmic gymnastics hoops category and more than winning the highest spot at the podium. Pinoy surfer Roger Kasugai shines the brightest after saving an Indonesian fellow competitor surfer who was being swept by strong waves during an official event. Despite the criticisms and allegations of corruptions against the organizers prior to the opening of the 30th Sea Games, Filipino athletes have shown pride and dedication in their sports and the spirit of winning as one. Bernard Daddy's UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Welcome back to Y News. We pick up to where Angela Lagunzat left off. I am Alex Baltazar, and here are the headlines. The Metropolitan Waterworks and Sewerage System has revoked the extension of concession agreements of both Manila Water Company Inc. and Mainilad Water Services Inc. Communist Party of the Philippines founder Joma Season agrees to resume peace talks with the government. Vape shops suffer low sales after President Duterte's vaping ban order. The Department of Transportation unveils six new train coaches for the Philippine National Railways line. And top-notch artists and the drone light show entertain spectators at the Sea Games closing ceremony in New Clark City Athletic Stadium in Kappa Starlock. Good evening. The Metropolitan Waterworks and Sewerage System cancels the extension of the water concession agreement with Mainilad and Manila Water. But according to the water concessionaires, this may result in a spike in the price of water services. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. The Board of Directors of the Metropolitan Waterworks and Sewer System, or MWSS, has revoked the resolution giving a 15-year extension of the water concession contract between MWSS and water concessionaires Mainilad and Manila Water. The resolution should have extended the services of Mainilad and Manila Water until 2037. But due to the revocation, the water concessionaire services are set to end by 2022 should they fail to renew the contract. 
they are now uh, revoking. The, I think the, the word is revoking the um, board resolution adopted in 2008. Right? The MWS has said this move was due to the directive coming from the office of the president on removing the onerous provisions on the agreement and rescinding the resolution granting the extension to the two water concessionaires. With the revocation, Representatives of water concessionaires confirmed to the Joint Committee hearing of the Committee on Good Governance and Public Accountability and the Committee on Public Accounts that a possible spike on water rates may happen. The rationale of the extension at the time was to mitigate any spikes in tariffs or pressure on tubig because nga ho, kailangan pong mag-invest pa ng mga water concessioners ng mas malaki. Kung mawawala yung extended term, talaga pong uh, napaka magkakaroon po ng mas malaking adjustment. But according to the MWSS, if the contract with the two water concessioners is not renewed, a rebidding may happen with new water service providers. This may somehow buffer the increase of water rates basing on the 15-year extension. In lieu of the current situation, water concessioners Maynilad and Manila Water reiterates their willingness to cooperate with the government to review and improve the water concession agreement. Both companies have already stated they are willing to follow the president's stand and they no longer pursue the more than 10 billion peso arbitral ruling. But lawmakers are pushing to end the duopoly of Maynilad and Manila Water in providing water services to Metro Manila and other areas in Luzon. Lawmakers are also pushing to have water concessionaires as well as the regulatory office held accountable for the anomalies and failure to comply with some provisions on the water concession agreement. Profiteering lang ang ginagawa nila eh. No, akala namin nalulugi sila. Hindi pa sila nalulugi. Lalo pa namalagi ang kanilang mga kinikita. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. President Rodrigo Duterte will read before the public the letters from Maynilat and Manila Water sent to his office for transparency. However, presidential spokesperson Salvador Panelo has yet to confirm when the president will do so. The said letters sent to him yesterday were signed by Mr. Manuel Pangilinan and Mr. Fernando Zobel de Ayala. The letters state the two water concessionaires are heeding the call of the president and are willing to revisit the concession agreements for amendments or revision that are onerous to the government and the public. The letters also state that two water distributors will no longer pursue their billions amount of claims against the government. Manila Water pointed finger at the former officials of the Metropolitan Water Works and Sewerage System as the one who crafted the questionable concession agreement. The water concessionaire also apologizes to the executive department regarding the arbitral ruling. Nel Maribobok tells us why. Dr. Angel Lazaro III, the former administrator of the Metropolitan Water Works and Sewerage System and one of those behind the 1997 concession agreement with water companies, attended today's Senate hearing. Lazaro admitted to senators they had no expertise that time, so they hired consultants to craft the concession deal. According to him, the consultants also asked the inputs of the bidders in the agreement, but senators questioned such procedure. <laughs> na gobyerno. Meron din hong contribution yung mga, yung mga bidders dito. Pero hindi yun na natin ma-identify yun kasi sa bandang huli yun, isang dokumento na lang. Pagkatapos nun ito, take it or leave it na lang. Magkano binayin natin sa consultant na ganun, na wala silang original idea. On the other hand, Manila Water President and CEO Jose Rene Almendras insists they are not involved in the crafting of the questionable concession deal. We had nothing to do with the terms of the contract. We have, were not even asked a single question, nor were we involved in the crafting of the contract. Almendras also apologized to the current administration on the arbitration award in which the government should pay 7.4 billion pesos to water companies for their losses. Humihingi po ko kami ng paumanin kung nagalit siya dahil sa arbitral ruling. Kaya ho namin inatras yung arbitral ruling dahil nagsalita na po ang Pangulo. Despite this, the water concessionaires are open for renegotiations after the MWSS revoked the extension of the concession deal. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines.
The Philippine National Police and the Armed Forces of the Philippines welcomed the decision of President Rodrigo Duterte not to extend the martial law in Mindanao. The PNP and the AFP vow to continue maintaining the peaceful situation and the security in the region. Harleen Delgado will tell us why. The Philippine National Police and the Armed Forces of the Philippines are pleased with the non-extension of martial law in Mindanao, set to expire on December 31st. Yesterday, the palace announced the decision of the chief executive not to extend the martial rule in the country's south after over two years. In a statement, the AFP say their recommendation to lift the martial law includes the improved security climate in Mindanao and the decline of local terrorist groups. The AFP add it will further promote an environment conducive to economic activities. Despite the non-extension, the armed forces vow to continue collaborating with communities to sustain the gains brought about by the martial law. They will also pursue their call to amend the Human Security Act into anti-terrorism law to give more teeth to counter terrorism. The PNP also vowed to continue their anti-criminality efforts in Mindanao. Well, wala namang magiging pagbabago. Uh, naroon pa rin ang ating mga uh, kwersa at ang buong hanay sa buong Mindanao. Yung bilang ng ating mga polis na roon ay uh, sapat para ito mapanatili natin ang uh, present situation na lalo pang uh, bumubuti. Meanwhile, Marawi City Mayor Majul Gandamra says he respects the president's decision, although he'd rather the martial law in the region be retained. Mayor Gandamra explains the quality of life in Marawi City has improved since martial law was imposed. He insists with the lifting of martial law, no one should be complacent as threats of violence may resurface. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue Camp Krame. Communist Party of the Philippines founder Jose Maria Sison agrees to reopen the peace talks with the Philippine government. Secretary Sylvester Bellio III clarifies as he returns in the Philippines from the Netherlands that President Rodrigo Duterte did not terminate the peace talks. Dante Amento tells us why. Labor Secretary Silvestre Bello III returned to the country on Monday coming from a meeting with Communist Party of the Philippines or CPV founder Jose Maria Sison in the Netherlands. Secretary Bello, who used to be the chairman of the Philippine Government Peace Panel, met with Sison after President Rodrigo Duterte said he will reopen the peace talks with the National Democratic Front of the Philippines or NDFP, the political wing of the Communist Rebel Group. According to the official, based on initial talks with the other members of the NDFP peace panel like Luis Salandoni and Fidel Agawili, the NDFP agrees to resume the peace talks with the Philippine government. Secretary Bellu adds they are also in favor of almost all the conditions given by President Duterte. Oh, I cannot uh, give you any details of the result of our talks, but lang importante na gusap kami, they are willing to resume the talks. It is not certain at this point whether or not the members of the government peace panel will change. Secretary Bellu also clarifies the president did not terminate the peace talks with the rebel group. Hindi naman niya in a Tinerminate yung talks eh. Ang tinerminate niya yung panel to panel. So they went into localized these talks, di ba? So nandun pa rin yung kanyang pagnanais na makamit ang panghabang buhay na kapayapaan. Secretary Bellio is expected to talk with President Duterte this evening to report the result of the meeting in the Netherlands. Dante Amento, UNTV, News and Rescue, City of Manila. The Department of Health is expecting the Office of the President to approve the executive order on cheaper medicines before the year ends. This as the DOH pushes for lowering the price of over 100 medicines in the country. Aiko Miguel details why. Filipinos are burdened by the continuous increase of prices of goods in the country. In addition to this are the expensive prices of medicines which Filipinos belonging to the poverty line and geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas cannot afford. Last September, the Department of Health submitted a list of medicines whose prices should be made cheaper and affordable. This proposal is for an executive order which for the DOH must be approved by President Rodrigo Duterte. 
The health department is positive the president will consider approving the maximum drug retail prices or MDRP pursuant to the Cheaper Medicines Act of 2008 or RA 9502. Well, hopefully, uh, as soon as possible, but chambre, the, we have to respect their process. The process is uh, to uh, consider all sides and consider all laws, that uh, there are no uh, conflicting laws uh, that may prove to be problematic in the future once we actually implement the MDRP. The health department admits that majority of the medicines in the country are expensive. This is why the DOH wants to make the prices of 122 medicines for hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, chronic lung diseases, neonatal diseases, and major cancers cheaper. It has appeared in a recent Pulse Asia survey that 99% of Filipinos aren't able to buy prescription medicines because of their high prices. Health Secretary Francisco Duque III cited an example in which a teacher who earns almost 800,000 pesos annually cannot afford cancer treatment, which costs 1.5 to 2 million pesos. Paano ka pa mabubuhay doon? Oh, may trabaho yan, ha? Tandaan niyo, may trabaho yan. May sinesweldo yan na regular, ha? Pero samahan ng gamot para kay nanay, para sa anak, para sa magulang, para sa asawa. Aba, eh, mamumulubi ka talaga. Malulumpo ka. According to the health chief, it was in 2009 when the DOH was able to lower the prices of five kinds of medicines in the country. For Secretary Duque, they are facing a tighter battle to have the MDRP approved as their proposal is composed of more than 100 medicines. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. The Department of Transportation unveils six new train coaches from Indonesia to run on the Philippine National Railways line. However, despite such developments with the PNR system, there is fair increase looming at the moment. Joan Anno tells us why. Six new train coaches manufactured in Indonesia have arrived in the country. These are among the 37 coaches purchased by the Philippine government amounting to some 3 billion pesos. All of the new train coaches are diesel multiple unit. The six new coaches will form two new train sets that will service passengers into Tuban to FTI and Malabon to FTI routes. According to Transportation Secretary Arthur Tugade, the new trains will be operational by December 16 or five days from now. What we are doing in rail is that we are trying to expand not only the coverage but more importantly we are trying to improve. We are trying to improve what we call the equipments and the facilities needed to make a smooth mobility and connectivity amongst its people. Fare in these routes is from 20 to 30 pesos. According to Philippine National Railway General Manager Jun Magno, each train set can ferry 750 to 800 passengers per trip. Ito, we're slating this for between 8 to 10 trips per day at 800. So that's around per set. Uh, that's another 8,000 uh, per day na capacity na we're putting in per train. So that's around 16,000 we're uh, introducing to the system. The additional trains will also shorten the headway or the time a train arrives at a certain station. The remaining coaches are expected to be delivered until March 2020. Once all the new trains become operational, around 18 to 20 trips per day will be added in the PNR service. The DOTR assures the new PNR coaches will not be similar with the controversial China-made Dalian trains. Authorities say these trains are all compatible with the PNR system. Despite such developments in their services, the PNR has yet to impose a fair hike. Secretary Tugade has announced the partial operations of the Calamba Laguna to Legaspi Albay route commenced by the end of 2021. Joan Anano, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. To complete the most significant news for this day, Y News continues. Here are the top stories. Several vape shops in Quezon City have been suffering low sales following President Rodrigo Duterte's order to ban vaping in public places. While for the Philippine National Police, the importation ban on e-cigarettes may be the start of the total ban on vape products in the country. Leia Ilagan will tell us why. 
Vape shops in some areas in Quezon City continue to operate. This is despite President Rodrigo Duterte's order to ban on use of vape products in public places. A vape store owner says their sales were affected by the President's order. Malaki po yung hinina ng vape natin. Kung dati po, nagsisales po, kunwari po ng mga, mga 10K ganyan, ngayon siguro mga 2K na lang. Mahina po talaga. Vape store owners like him are also worried about the tax increase on all vape products because in turn, the price of vape will also increase which ordinary vapers may not afford. Pag nag-tax sila dyan, medyo mataas na talaga yan. Siguro 3 to 5 thousands na ganyan. Then sa juice po, ang alam ko po, 45 pesos per ml ang itataas nila. So kung 50 pesos times 45 pesos, medyo mabigat na po yan. Vape shop owners are also afraid to lose their business due to the total importation ban on vape products. Galing po ibang masalat ng aming ano eh. Hindi ko pa lang po alam kung meron dito. For the Philippine National Police, they are positive the importation ban on vape is the part of the total ban on e-cigarettes in the Philippines. Nakikita natin na patuloy or patungo na doon ang direksyon ng ating bansa sa total ban ng vapes and e-cigarettes at uh, ito ay alinsunod sa uh, kautusan ng Pangulo ng uh, pagkakaroon natin ng smoke-free environment and uh, public spaces alang-alang sa Uh, public health. Based on data from the National Capital Region Police Office or NCRPO, 812 vape shops in Metro Manila have been closed and 297 have been advised to voluntarily shut down. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Department of Tourism has recorded a significant increase in the revenue of the tourism sector this year. The Tourism Department hopes to sustain such increase next year. Let's find out why from Asher Kadapan Jr. Tourism contributes to the economic growth of the country. It generates business enterprises and employment in the field of hospitality, particularly the establishment of hotels, restaurants, transportation, and tour services. With an increase in the number of tourist arrivals in the Philippines this year, the Department of Tourism, or DOT, has confirmed a significant increase in the revenue of the country's tourism sector. From January to October 2019, the revenue reached about 23.5 billion pesos, gaining a 25% increase from last year's record. Korea topped the most number of tourist arrivals in the Philippines in the first 10 months this year, followed by China, the U.S., Japan, and Taiwan. Boracay Island in Aklan, on the other hand, remains to be the most visited destination in the country. Actually, it's a big factor when we, the, when we talk to the tour operators. Nakilala rin ang Pilipinas because of Boracay. A lot of people want to come here, kaya naging number one ang Boracay because of the sustainable tourism efforts. As the Philippines become more and more popular for its world-class tourist destinations, the Tourism Department is looking forward to a sustained economic growth next year. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, City of Manila. And for the news abroad, here's Stephanie C. reporting live from Hong Kong. Steph, good evening. Good evening, Alex. Searchers using planes, ships, and satellites were combing Antarctic seas on Tuesday, hunting for a Chilean Air Force transport plane carrying 38 people that vanished en route to a base on the frozen continent. Katumaraos reports. A Chilean military plane with 38 people on board lost radio communication after taking off from the south of the country for a base in Antarctica. In a statement, Chile's Air Force said it was yet to find a plane but concluded it must have crashed given the number of hours it had been missing. Defense Minister Alberto Espina added that the chance of finding survivors was looking difficult. The C-130 Hercules took off at 4.55 p.m. local time from the city of Punta Arenas on Monday to the President Eduardo Frey Antarctic base and lost contact at 6.13 p.m., the Air Force said in a statement. The plane carried 17 crew members and 21 passengers, including three civilians. The personnel were to check on a floating fuel supply line and other equipment at the Chilean base. President Sebastián Pinera said in a tweet that he would fly to Punta Arenas along with Interior Minister Gonzalo Blumel. 
Drake's Passage, where the plane went missing, is known for severe weather conditions, including freezing temperatures and ferocious storms. But the Air Force said late on Monday that the weather was good when the plane began its flight or the mission would not have been carried out. Kat Numaraos, TV News and Rescue. A police officer was among the six people killed in a lengthy gun battle in the Jersey City. Initial investigations reveal that the officer was killed while trying to interdict a group of gunmen. Miguel Ray de Leon reports. Six people died Tuesday in a gunfight between police and suspects in Jersey City, New Jersey. Among the fatalities is police officer Joseph Seals, a member of the municipal force since 2006. Preliminary reports indicate that Seals was killed while trying to interdict the bad guys. Law enforcement sources said that the incident began after Seals and another officer spotted a van suspected of being linked to a homicide last weekend in Bayonne, New Jersey. As the police approached the vehicle, one suspect emerged and fired shots, hitting Seals in the head and the other officer in the shoulder. The suspects then drove off and holed up inside the Jersey City Kosher supermarket. Police followed the suspects to the store and a standoff ensued. The Jersey City Police said the investigation into the incident may take weeks or months, pointing to the challenge of piercing together events that unfolded over the course of hours at multiple locations. However, officials say the violence did not appear to have connection to terrorism. Miguel Rey de Leon, UNTV News and Rescue, New Jersey, USA. Authorities in New Zealand were still searching for eight missing tourists after a volcano on an uninhabited island of the country's northeastern coast erupted, killing at least six people who were visiting the islet. Elsie Marcos will tell us why. New Zealand's White Island volcano is showing increased seismic activity, putting recovery efforts on hold. Police Minister Stuart Nash said there were poisonous gases coming from the volcanic vent and that the island was blanketed in a thick layer of acidic ash. Authorities hoped they would be able to retrieve the eight people presumed dead on the islands on Wednesday. So far, six people have been confirmed dead in the tragedy. Another 25 are in critical condition in hospital with severe burns. Officials said they are working with disaster specialists and forensic experts to identify the victims so they can be returned to their families. Our hearts go out to the families of those who are injured, missing or deceased. Among those injured or missing are people from Australia, the United States, the UK, China, Germany, Malaysia, as well as New Zealand. Meanwhile, New Zealand police opened an investigation to determine the circumstances surrounding the tragedy. New Zealand Police Deputy Commissioner John Tim said the investigation will include tour operators who organize excursions to the aisle. Uh, so we'll uh, look into um, if there's anyone criminally responsible for the, the deaths and injuries. Uh, it's, an, it's early days yet, um, so we're just going to have to uh, work through the evidence, uh, talk to people uh, and conduct the investigation. New Zealand authorities have established a security perimeter and the immediate cancellation of all excursions, including tourist boats, around the island. On December 3, the Geological Activity Control Group Geonet warned that the Fakaari volcano might be entering a period where the eruptive activity is more likely than normal. Although it said that the situation would not pose a direct danger to visitors. LC Marcus, UNTV News and Rescue, New Zealand. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Stephanie C. Reporting live from Hong Kong. The 30th the Southeast Asian Games officially ends tonight. Let's find out what's happening at the new Clark City with Mai Bermudez Live. Mai, how's it going there? Alex, the 2019 Southeast Asian Games officially comes to a close as a thousand 
thousands of athletes, delegates, and spectators from 11 participating nations attend the closing ceremony here at the Athletic Stadium in New Clark City. The Philippines was awarded as the overall champion after bagging more than 300 medals during the sporting event. Philippines' Roger Kasugai was hailed as the fair play athlete of the 2019 SEA Games after their heroic act he has done during the surfing event competition in La Union where he saved his competitor from Indonesia. Best male mega player and best female mega player of 2019 SEA Games came from Singapore and Vietnam respectively. 3D fireworks display was one of the highlights of tonight's event as a majestic sporting events were seen as fireworks in the sky tonight. FISGOC Chairman Alan Peter Cayetano gave a message and addressed those who spread criticisms and alleged fake news on the country's SEA Games hosting. He says, quote, Peace be with you and have a Merry Christmas. Ceremonial handover of SEA Games flag was also held earlier where the Philippines gave the flag to Vietnam. Another fireworks display was held before the event was um, ended earlier and the Black Eyed Peas held a concert earlier here at the Athletic Stadium. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Mai. Reporting live from New Clark City, Kappa Starlock. President Rodrigo Duterte meets with the Philippine surfing team, including Roger Kasugai, who saved his Indonesian rival from drowning during the 30th Southeast Asian Games. Mirasol Abogadil reports. SEA Games gold medalist Roger Kasugai and the rest of the team paid a courtesy call to President Rodrigo Duterte in Malacanang this morning. Kasugai earned praises after he rescued Indonesian surfer Arip Nuridayat who was swept by rolling waves after he broke his leash in the middle of men's longboard open surfing competition in La Union. <laughs> Yun, hindi naman siya nalulunod talaga. Nag-float siya, sinusubukan niyang makabalik sa shoreline. Kaso malakas yung car, natatangay siya palabas. Tapos ako yung pinakamalapit na nandun sa kung nasaan siya. The 25-year-old surfer eventually won the gold medal after the event between the two was rescheduled on Sunday. Indonesian President Joko Widodo on Monday expressed his appreciation for Kasugai for personifying sportsmanship in the ongoing biennial meet. The Senate also adopted a resolution commending the athlete for displaying an act of heroism and courage. Senator Christopher Lawrence Bongo said Kasugai will be conferred the Order of Lapu-Lapu by the President in a palace ceremony next week. Walang dudang si Kasugai ang hero ng 30th Southeast Asian Games. The Order of Lapu-Lapu is bestowed upon individuals who are recognized for their invaluable service in relation to a campaign or advocacy of the President. Kasugai was earlier chosen to be the country's flag bearer in the SEA Games closing ceremonies to be held on Wednesday at the new Clark City in Tarlac. Mirsol Abugadil, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the reasons behind the news this December 11, 2019. On behalf of Angela Lagunzad, I am Alex Baltazar because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening.